I think the reason people really think Barney Frank is terrific is not because he's so smart and not because he's openly gay, although that has something to do with it, it's because he's a person of deep conviction and somebody with great courage. And unfortunately, that's a very small supply uh, in Congress. And Barney has led by example and by exerting the morality of his views on his colleagues because they admired him greatly uh, when he was there. And I, 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 I'm sorry that he's left. I'm glad for him, but not glad for the country. So without further ado, Barney Frank. I agree that it's important that we reduce deficit, not immediately. I think it is very clear that the uh, short term, with the unemployment situation still not a good one, we should not be cutting spending. Alan Binder, the former deputy governor, the, the, the vice chair of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, had an excellent article in the Wall Street Journal the other day in which he noted that if public sector jobs had simply been even over the last few years, unemployment would be much lower than it is today. That is, this notion that the public sector is choking the private sector is exactly the opposite. It is a fairly good public private sector recovery, and the reason the recovery in employment has slowed down is that we have hacked away an important public sector job. There is no threat to the United States that justifies anything like this. And yes, I want to spend money to contain the terrorists, but you don't defeat terrorists with nuclear submarines. I wish you did, because they don't have any, and we have a lot, and then it would be over. Um, what they do, though, is continue to spend part of the problem. A high-ranking military guy told a friend of mine, I said, tell that guy he's right. One of the problems is when we bulk up militarily to meet a threat, and the threat goes away, the spending doesn't. We are still fully prepared to win a thermonuclear war against the Soviet Union, despite the absence of the Soviet Union. Uh, and, you know, there's still Russia, not a great place. I am so happy that my grandparents got the hell out of there. But it's not a threat to the United States. I mean, Russia did win a war against Georgia. Um, by the way, that's the nation of Georgia, not the state of Georgia. And I say that because Given the influence that the Georgian congressional representative had, Georgia is so heavily armed that it's not clear that Russia could defeat the state of Georgia. <laughs> Thermonuclear weapons on the Soviet Union through nuclear submarines, intercontinental ballistic missiles, or airplanes. And I have a serious suggestion and a serious policy proposal. We say to the Pentagon, you have three ways to wage war on the Soviet Union with thermonuclear weapons. Pick two. Give up one, let us save billions of dollars a year. We went into World War, into Europe after World War II. I think Harry Truman did the right thing because Stalin was aggressive and he was threatening democratic nations. And they were too poor from World War II to defend themselves. So we went in there to defend them. We are still there. The war in Iraq, of course, was an entirely unnecessary war. And by the way, for those who worry about Syria, and I do, I certainly don't want to see Assad, Consolidate. One of the major sources of strength for Syria is, of course, today the regime that we installed in Iraq. The Iraq government allows the Iranians to fly over Iraq to send weapons to Syria. That's the fruit of that particular intervention. Here's the problem with these interventions. We make a mistake about what the military can accomplish. We have an excellent military. They can do very well what a military can do. They can stop bad things from happening. They cannot make good things happen. They cannot make Somalia a coherent country. We can't get Sudan and South Sudan to get along. We can't make Sunni and Shia get together. We can't end corruption in Afghanistan. And we are engaged in trying to do that. Now, I do believe we should be the strongest nation in the world. Some may think here, well, that's xenophobic. I mean, just somebody's got to be the strongest nation in the world, as a matter of fact. And as I look at the candidates, I, I'm for us, I, I will be honest, if Denmark was capable of being the strongest nation in the world, I would rest very easy. But they can't hack it. So it's us, or China, maybe Indonesia. But we can be the strongest nation in the world and defend our legitimate interests with 25% or more or less than we are now doing. They belittle the notion that our national purpose should be to make the lives of our own citizens better and protect the environment, and, and I am not an isolationist, 
I would like to take some piece of what we save militarily and put more into fighting malaria and AIDS, which we know we can do effectively, feeding hungry children, providing economic assistance. Yeah, I, I want us to do more engagement economically. They hoke up self-interested reasons. And they don't want to say, well, instability anywhere threatens America. No, it doesn't. I deeply regret the situation in Somalia, but it doesn't threaten America. Look, I gotta be honest, I gotta tell this to some of my friends on the left. One of our shibboleths is, uh, nobody is free until everybody is free. That's not true. I mean, if that were true, nobody would ever have been free, because everybody has never been free. That doesn't mean you're happy that other people aren't free and they don't want to help them. But this notion that stability anywhere is the United States is blatantly untrue. And it doesn't mean we should be purely selfish, but you figure out what you can do and what you can't do. Tell members of Congress in particular that they should be supporting reducing the military budget rather than Medicare.